The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed. I'm Kat Napsok for a special edition, a return of sorts, of Star Wars Ranked, episode 154 in an ongoing series of us looking at our favorite things in Star Wars. I'm Ken Napsok, and this is technically a guest on this show, the way we always phrase it, but really, it's uh, the co-pilot on this journey is always Joseph Scrimshaw. Hi, buddy. I'm very, very happy uh, to grab the uh, hyperspace uh, projection device <laughs> with both our hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that's uh, that's what we're gonna do today. We are excited. Uh, it's not like Star Wars ranked uh, went away. We just had a lot of fun doing Data Bank Dive, and we wanted to make these ranks uh, very special and and very uh, you know targeted and a uh, spotlight on what we want to discuss. And right now we got something uh, that we absolutely need to discuss. Joseph, it's our favorite Andor moments. I'll start here. What does that make you think when you hear that title? Where does your mind go? <laughs> Uh, my mind makes a Charlie Brown noise. You know when uh, Charlie Brown is is uh, written is uh, thinking or saying a u g h h. The we talk on them every episode that wow this list was perhaps the hardest ever. Right, right. This one was extremely difficult because there's a lot of storytelling in Andor mm-hmm. and uh, there are so many moments from big important moments that we've all uh discussed and absorbed a lot to these little tiny intimate moments that it was really hard to pick not just the moments but the kind of the style of the moments you're absolutely right we're in the same mindset difficult in a way that i don't think i'd experienced on star wars ranked previously because uh the style of the show the presentation of the show the much discussed version of star wars that this show is which we love and we're here to celebrate but that creates moments that uh, you'll see on my list i'll probably pre-apologize now I'll, I'll do that now and then throughout the show i some my choices sometimes are obvious and pedestrian in my heart and soul but i, <laughs> I want to like uh, be different go deeper but no these are the moments that reach out to me but one of the reasons when I, I asked you like hey what did you think when i asked myself that question I just went to a lot of moments I couldn't remember because their asides or their size or their hand movements or their uh, little moments that are so character based, which is what the show did well. And it's like I almost became overwhelmed. Mm. Yeah, no, it is utterly uh, overwhelming. And I I wanted to just highlight so many different characters. And uh, thank goodness for our runner ups or honorable mentions. I'd be lost without them this time. Uh, 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 um, I'm stumbling over it because I'm so excited. Yeah, our honorable mentions will uh, some they sometimes will spiral out into their own bonus episodes of Star Wars Rank. We try to contain <laughs> ourselves, but some more on the way. So we'll start diving in the show. No reason to delay. For those who maybe are newer to Force Center and haven't uh, listened to Star Wars Rank before, the archives are there if you want to go back. But what we do, we rank five to one. And yes, it's a ranking. Ranking is fun. We always uh, like to phrase it these days as our favorite. It's uh, me and Joseph, whoever's on the show, our favorite. It's our interpretation, our point of view. You might have a different list. In fact, I want you to have a different list and tweet it out. Hashtag Star Wars Ranked and let us know what your list is or maybe you agree with some of our choices. So we'll work our way five to one. Joseph, you lead off here with your number five favorite and or moment. Uh, my number five, I had to start with the the first and or character that I fell in love with out of many. <laughs> so bang your Beskar. <laughs> I am honoring uh, the time grappler. Uh, I didn't look up for sure. I believe that somewhere uh, it's, it is said that his uh, his medal that he plays uh, to signal the day's end and the day's beginning uh, is Beskar. But my apologies if I'm wrong and said bang your Beskar. Anyway, uh, I wanted to highlight the time grappler. Uh, th- we were so uh, excited for the trailer. Mm-hmm. The trailer released at Star Wars Celebration. You and I weren't able to uh, get into one of the panels, so we were standing in line with a bunch of people all pulling out their phones, <laughs> listening to that trailer in this incredibly odd syncopated rhythm of the time grapplers' bangs and dings <laughs> going off at different times on different people's phones. It was a really fun moment and and kind of a perfect moment because that's what the time grappler is, right? Yes. Uh, that This figure, this odd figure, uh, that brings the community together, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's mm-hmm. what was powerful about the character in the trailer, that it, it set up very well what we did see in the show, that the the Empire and, and what we came to understand was that this uh, corporate sector authority uh, were sticking their noses into uh, a very unified culture and uh, paying the price. 
uh, for not understanding what this culture is, what it values. Uh, and that's what I love about the time grappler is that he is this symbol of this uh, culture that's uh, very grounded. Uh, he is something that seems on the surface Super bizarre, right? A, a guy who walks up into a tower and physically bangs on, you know, the, the town alarm clock. Uh, mm. And his name is Time Grappler. <laughs> so he, this is one of these perfect Star Wars things that is both mm. interesting, bizarre, different, but also just so grounded, right? Anybody mm -hmm. who's ever uh, uh, worked in any job like that, any community like that, it, it is those kinds of figures who hold the community together. So love the Time Grappler on multiple levels. Love the performance, the burly guy, Cyan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the mix that it's, it's, it's so, uh, I'm sounding the bell for the beginning of the day, for the end of the day. It's so, you know, union, it's so workers, right? <laughs> but he's all up there doing it like it's a ballet, like he is playing yes. a sacred instrument right like it's mm -hmm. it's like sacred cultural drumming and mm -hmm. you know the most just like train whistle you know yeah. it, it's both uh so that i loved about it as well my moment is the time grappler kicking the stormtrooper out of the tower a ton of people love that i know you're a big fan uh, yeah. as well ken but i think uh, you know the time grappler was kind of just there in the background a, a part of that resistance uh to the corporate uh security uh and then that that great fear that when the Imperial said, get that guy, <laughs> yes. that that was going to be it for time grappler. It, 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 my heart went so low. Uh, and then it took me so high when the time grappler was just like, not today stormtrooper," <laughs> And then performed my favorite of all star Wars actions, uh, somebody falling from a high place. So that's my number five. This is a great way to start it. I wouldn't want it any other way. You are saying so many things. First of all, I've been watching this great documentary series on uh, Apple TV called 1971, the year that music changed everything. It is spectacular. But the episode, the third episode focuses a lot on T-Rex and Mark Boland and uh, going into uh, Get It On, Bang and Gong, Get It On. So as you're talking, I'm just hearing that song, which is a lot of diff different meaning, we'll say, uh, to Time Grappler. But I want someone to do that super cut of, of him just uh, banging that best car, like you said. It is. And, and you're saying something, too, that's exciting. Um, for me to look back on that particular day when the trailer was released, you and I've talked about this on, on air. It was a frustrating day for you and I, just in terms of force center as a business, as a, as a, a punditry uh, operation, trying to get in to see things that we needed to talk about. And you and I got, got in our head a little bit, got a little grumpy. We couldn't get access. And then we ended up in that line and we ended up just hearing that trailer with everyone. And I wouldn't trade that moment for any, uh, any of the access, the convention dangles in front of you. That was a beautiful moment. And it was all the time grappler. It was a time grappler. No, I, I'm entirely with you. It was in, in through that rest of that day. You're like, I would go into a bathroom and I would just hear that ringing out. I'm like, yes. I'm, I think somebody's watching the trailer in the stall, you know, <laughs> just stall after stall with <laughs> gong, 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 gong. It was spectacular. In this moment, I, I'm with you. You, you. You're right there on that idea of like, oh, the time grappler is dead because the show, not that the show was killing off everyone along the way in the first 11 episodes, but it was a, as we uh, will probably mention again, a little dark, a little somber of, uh, ep you know, episodes here for Star Wars. So it just had that like, oh, the crushing uh, oppression of the Empire is going to take him, but not today. There was hope in that final episode and it was all in that kick of the stormtrooper. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think for me, that's that's my pre-apology. There are definitely some dark moments, but I think Andor's darkness really made the the hope uh, shine brighter. And a lot of my moments are those moments of of hope. So that's where I'm heading. That's my number five. That is a great number five. My number five, uh, it is not about hope. It is about fear. It is about oppression. It is about uh, puffing up your chest to show how strong you are. And that's not necessarily a good thing here. My number five, going to uh, uh, episode five, the axe forgets. It's the shrieking tie fighter, the symbol of oppression. This, uh, like you said, with the kick of the time grappler, was celebrated online. A lot of people commenting that, wow, the, the after years of watching TIE Fighters, which do come off as uh, fun, uh, you know, uh, vehicles in Star Wars with memorable sounds, but they're a little bit of cannon fodder. It's kind of what's going on with TIE Fighters and the TIE Fighter system there, the, at least the classic ones. But I heard a lot of people saying, and I agree with it, and this is one of those ones where it's like, I, I, should I pick something else that's a little less obvious? But no, I'm with everybody on it. This uh, this moment turned the TIE Fighters into something that I knew they were, but had never really experienced this absolute symbol of oppression it connected a lot of people connected it to thank kyrell in lost cause uh lost star excuse me um <laughs> and and a lost cause um 
Lost Stars, uh, he, he did this and, and it was part of his duty. And this is not um, too far removed from maybe, say, some real world tactics to show your might. Uh, so everything about it. Uh, and this also goes into this, you know, the discourse around Andor is something that always comes up. But there were some moments where I, I discussed with some fans offline, off air, in person that they're like, I love Andor, which I love Andor as well. And they were like, they're just, it didn't. It wasn't Star Wars. One particular kid I'd met said, I love that it wasn't until like episode four or five that you even saw Stormtroopers. And that's his point of view. And a lot of people agree with that. I don't necessarily agree with that. But I have to admit, until this moment, we hadn't seen a TIE fighter. And then when it showed up and it shrieked over the head of the uh, rebels there on Aldani, it was really effective. And I'm all there for that. So this is my number five moment. The shrieking TIE fighter showing the supposed might of the empire, which also prompted that great line from Nemec about, Hey, they never uh, really are a paraphrase course, but never really see the attack from below. So I love everything that this moment means. Oh, that is great. Um, we did, we did see a TIE fighter earlier, right? When, uh, when so. Cassian and uh, Vel were initially climbing to the uh, rebel yes. camp. Yes. Yes. The little one. Yeah, you're correct. That's kind of the first shot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, the one that there shrieks over them. Yeah. And the water yeah. ripples. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. But it, but it's in the distance and this one is uh, different because that one's kind of a, a little bit farther away. It's a patrol. It's still scary, but this yeah. one is about, you know, we, we, it's kind of the TIE fighters in a different role. Cause we've seen the, the TIE fighters is, you know, uh, guards of mm -hmm. bigger ships or to be deployed by star destroyers, but they're almost always, not always, but almost always like in pursuit. I've been rewatching rebels and like every, every member of the rebels team <laughs> has yeah. an amazingly high TIE fighter kill count. Right. Uh, <laughs> but the TIE fighters are almost always in this role of sort of uh, maybe they're blocking you know, entry to something, but maybe they're responding to rebels. This is different to say, uh, I don't have anything better to do. I'm just going to go terrorize the countryside. Yes. If there's any weak little, uh, you know, weirdo up in the hills, mm -hmm. speaking from the empire's perspective, the weak weirdos clinging to their old ways, I'm going to blow their hat off their head and make them, you know, yeah terrified i'm gonna remind them that this yeah. planet is ours now it's a different role for the tie fighter and i think it's uh, i always love the old and the new in star wars and i think that shriek sound of the tie fighter is one of the most famous one of the most popular sound effects in star wars i think it was you mm -hmm. know terrifying in the first film when the, yeah the, you saw those tie fighters chasing our heroes being uh, considered a big threat shooting down mm -hmm. <laughs> almost all of the rebel ships right uh yeah. they were scary and this made them scary in a brand new way that made perfect sense and just great yeah there you go the old and the new love the moment and yes for all those years of taking the toys or on the playground and making a tie fighter sound which i won't do here because it will destroy your ears uh, it was great to see it and feel it in a new way. So that's my number five starting us off here, which means we're going up to your number four. Uh, my number four is a uh, a short moment, but uh, had a big impact on me. My number four is Luthen's transformation on the ship. Uh, the horror in the beauty, in the absurdity, in the pain of mm. sudden Luthen cosplay. Mm -hmm. um, that... Uh, we had seen in the trailers, right, of like, oh, is this a time jump? What's going on? Because we'd seen the the, the two different hairstyles Luthen was rocking. <laughs> uh, we get introduced to him as this, uh, you know, sort of mysterious figure, but very clearly all in, you know, the Empire must be fought, you know, death. They're going to kill you one way or another. Do you, so do you want to die fighting them, right? All this intensity, uh, uh, the the yelling at Vel, right? Of like uh, how how much she needs to take this seriously, the huge risk and the necessity mm -hmm. that Aldani succeed. All that. All that build up to then watch him open a closet and put on a costume, right? In mm -hmm. it, it, we've seen a million people dress up as stormtroopers, but to put on those rings, to put on a wig which in in, in the wrong spinning could be like absurd or silly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh and then to go all the way through to that moment where he's got the rings on, he's got the the wig on, he's got the the different clothing on, mm. and he needs to get into character for himself. He does the little hand gesture, 
in the little laugh and he remembers how to be this fake person. Um, there's a ton of moments that I love in the shop where he's, uh, pretending, uh, to be that Luthan, the aficionado and, you know, some of the turns, uh, 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 toward Mothma with one face and then a different face. Those are all great. But for me, then the moment is the first time on the ship. Uh, I really relate to it, uh, as a performer. Uh, I used to tell my friends that I did sketch comedy with of like, uh, Give me a, a weird hat and a hand gesture. That's a whole character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so his whole thing about like that hand that's just kind of floaty and almost subservient is like, mm-hmm. yep, that's what this is about. And, and I think uh, the performance is amazing. Uh, the way it's shot is amazing. And, and what it cuts to for me is this idea of the, the pain of Luthen being so obsessed with uh, the only thing that matters is taking down the empire and I want to give everything I have to it. But in order to do that, I need to play somebody, not just somebody uh, uh, who who isn't a militant uh, uh, rebel, Mm. uh, but somebody who invests in apathy, somebody who can look at all the horror going on in the entire galaxy and laugh and sell art. He transforms Mm. into an image of the mm. upper class's ability to ignore the horror. And and I think that's all there in the scene. Man, all right. So invest in apathy. Is that a scrimshawism or something you picked up? Because um that 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 resonates with me for a lot of things in my own life, which may have nothing to do with Luther. But I want to I, I, I really love you shows this moment. There's a lot of the aficionado moment is spectacular in so many ways. But you're absolutely right. Now we had heard going in, yes, there was confusion on what we got, time jumps, isn't that? Then maybe I think at some point, ah, uh, maybe he's undercover and popped up. I don't know. But there was an interview and Stellan, Stellan Skarsgard, spectacular actor, without a doubt, had given some interviews where you're like, Well, I guess this happened happens in episode 11 because he had kind of <laughs> following the Mads Mikkelsen school of, yeah, let me tell you what I'm doing, which actually follows the Lando Billy D. Williams from 1980 <laughs> interviews of, uh, of giving away the plot. Uh, but he had said something about the hand things. Uh, I've done some sketch before in my day. Uh, not much of an actor myself, but you're, you're so right. Uh, that's a lot of the movements. And, and so I read that and I was like, sure, okay, that's awesome. Makes sense. But to actually see it, to actually see what it meant, and it does remind me, it could be it could be almost viewed as unintentional comedy, right? As, yeah, he's doing this and he's getting in the character. But you're right to hit on what the stakes are and who he is becoming and what that represents in the galaxy. We see time and time again these people in this show or Rogue One, your, your boy Nord Jabal, your, 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 your uh, <laughs> the guy you love to hate there. Um, this kind of reminds me of those kind of, the upper cross, right? These are the people at the opera in Revenge of the Sith while Palpatine's laying out the plan to, to Anakin to turn him. Um, and, and to see it actually there it just kind of reminds me of uh, why he needs to do this and who he is becoming and yeah. why no one would see beyond that. Yeah, in in the horror of that, you know, if mm-hmm. you take any improv class or acting class, you know, one of the first things you'll learn, maybe it's changed, I haven't done it in a long time, is, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of high status in low status. And we've mm-hmm. seen uh, people do that of like, I want to blend into a crowd, my, my shoulders slump, I'm low status, don't pay attention to me. Mm-hmm. And the idea that instead of that transformation, he turns into somebody who is so uh, mm-hmm. silly and all in that he can be loud. He's a loud character. He's hiding yeah. by being a loud character. He's going, none of this matters. Our, our concerns are petty. Would you like to buy yeah. some art? You know? Yeah. It, he's hiding as a loud character, which is really fast. That's fantastic. Yeah. And there, he has a little exchange a little bit later with that woman who's you know trying to buy a piece and he's kind of like, you can make a, make it what you want or whatever the line is. And it's like, that's great. But it, 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 you need this moment of him transforming, especially what we, what we had seen so far in the series of him, the, the low growls, the laser fighting, the blasters. To see him turn to that, it was powerful. Great moment. Yeah, Great yeah. Moment. So that's my number four. Great number four. We're rocking and rolling here as we move along. My number four is, uh, I think it's uh, some similar themes, at least for me. And my number four is from episode eight, Narkina 5. Great episode. And it is the what I'm calling Mothma's What is Public Order scene. It is a tiny little moment, but you and I discussed this. This is at the uh, one of the big, the big dinner party. Slymore, we didn't see, unfortunately. Uh, her and Perrin and Tay are having the drinks, and and there's a lot going on there. Lita, uh, Lita giving the side eye to Tay. There's a lot going on in that scene, <laughs> a lot to discuss. But you and I really discussed the importance and the meaning of the conversation she had with some of the uh, dinner guests there. 
where they're having the conversation. It's kind of coming, uh, it's midstream when Mothma walks up about, you know, Palpatine's frustrating. Yes, we agree. Too easily provoked. Yes, overactive. But he says what he means. We're discussing legislation, mm. not speeches. And Mothma has this great line. What does he mean? What is public order. It's an awfully big box, isn't it? Someone says, and the emperor's primary charge is to protect us. Is it not? I, I guess I could go through the whole scene, <laughs> uh, but you have the one uh, key line of, uh, you know, the guest saying, if you've done nothing wrong, what is there to fear? And Mothma says, I fear your definition of wrong. And it kind of ends the conversation because it's too good of a point, I felt. And everyone's, well, these are dangerous times, too dangerous times and all these kind of things. But Mothma's still asking the important questions. Do you feel under threat? And it is a very, uh, very real world scene. And you could plug in the name, quite frankly, of a lot of different po political figures over the years. I think there's one that's in, in particular uh, in mind, uh, particularly in mind for this scene from the writers. Uh, but you all can plug in who you want, I guess. But it's an important scene, it's an important scene for Star Wars. And it's an important scene, I think, for what this show set out to do which is to present this very real grounded look at what's going on in the galaxy at this time as the fascists are uh, taking over and have control and continue to uh, uh, put the oppression out there and to see how it all falls. This all pays, I think, into Padme's This Is How uh, Liberty Dies with Thunder of Plus. It's all that. And it's in this quiet little dinner scene and I joked at the time, like, hey, take this conversation to your parents during the holidays. Uh, and it's, it resonates. And, and it, I guess try to keep it and or in Star Wars. It just was much like your Lutheran thing of here, who he, this is who he is. And maybe it's a reminder of why he's making that fight, because these are the, these, those people are real in the galaxy. Um, the apathy here and the mm -hmm. just uh, up in the high tower. And well, we've done nothing wrong. Um, it have Mothma there amongst that because that's who she is. She's upper crust. She is the rich girl from Chandrilla. She has her long political career. She probably hasn't struggled much on the surface level with needs and wants for just getting by. And this is probably a reminder to her of why we're fighting and not just in the way of um, you'd think maybe coming into a show like this about the rebellion of shaking a fist at the powers above, but it's, it's shaking a fist at the people right there with you who don't see what's happening, who don't want to engage with what's happening. Uh, I absolutely loved it. It was a reminder of why she is literally risking everything. And there's so many great scenes. We're not done talking about Mothma. Uh, but I, I, I really love that scene. It personally resonated. I watched it again a few times this morning. It's a tiny blip of a scene. It says everything about what's going on around Mothma and with Mothma in this show. And that's why it's my number four moment. What is public order? Oh, it, that's, it's really, really great. I think it is really powerful in the context of the Star Wars story, in the context of Andor. I think it'd be a powerful scene kind of by itself, right? But the fact yeah. that uh, we are being presented that this is the story of Star Wars, that Mothma is one million percent correct. We saw Andor get picked up for being on a beach. Yeah. Um, it, and not just uh, punished for doing literally nothing, mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, enslaved you know mm -hmm. um and then everybody giving everything they have to escape uh and at least in the, in the case of melshi to do anything to get the word out and to let people know mm -hmm. and if melshi succeeds in getting the word out it's going to affect a lot of people to find out like mm -hmm. uh you know people are being picked up for literally doing nothing and then they are being uh sentenced to die in labor camps yeah. Um, that's going to hit a lot of people. It's not going to hit these senators. Right. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And I think that's the power of, of that discussion, that argument. Um, you can draw parallels to, uh, current events, but you can also draw parallels like the writers have, have described to events throughout history. You know, mm -hmm. it's a familiar playbook for, uh, somebody who wants to, uh, scoop up a lot of power, a lot of control to say, there are these others uh, and in order to stop them from violating our, our perfect gleaming society, uh, we must inflict order. You get people like Freck from Kenobi going, what's yeah. wrong with a little bit of order, right? Yeah. And I think that the problem with it is exactly what Mothma is pointing out. It's like, well, if you don't question the definitions of, cool, yeah, no, if if somebody has a, a attack your society you gotta defend yourself and plenty of discussions ab about that to happen but what if the definitions are wrong what if the people being scooped up haven't actually done anything and what if the way they're being punished is not actually the way you're being told 
you know, then you're giving everything to, to these people who are claiming that they're saving you from these scary others. You're giving all of the power to them, all of your freedom to them for absolutely nothing, all because you don't want to look or question. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it is, it, it isn't just one-to-one. It is for anything. Uh, it, it, mm-hmm. it certainly can be applied one-to-one, but what I'm saying is it, it's a structure. It's a structure of, of, of manipulation and propaganda that has happened again and again throughout many mm-hmm. cultures. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what makes it so important. Yep, absolutely. It is uh, even looking at our notes of this episode, a lot of the upstairs, downstairs stuff at play. Uh, you got the stuff about, uh, you know, them, uh, Mothman parent never looking out the windows anymore, right? And it's a reminder mm-hmm. of looking out and maybe looking down. So big moment there. We're not done talking about Mothman, though, in any uh, stretch of the imagination. What is your number three moment? My number three is Mothma. We're <laughs> just just the character. No, we're staying in Mothma Town. Uh, I've mentioned it on our Andor report. Uh, uh, almost every Mothma scene uh, might be my favorite, but the one that really resonates with me uh, is from uh, Chapter Seven, uh, Episode Seven announcement. Uh, it's Mothma's mm-hmm. smile scene. Um, mm-hmm. it, the whole scene, but really, you know, driving to that one moment where she says for the final time to take Colma a smile. Mm-hmm. It's a scene that's fascinating to me because it is a scene of absolute terror and absolute power. Mm. Uh, it is Mothma uh, demonstrating her commitment to the rebellion that she needs to get the funds flowing again. So she needs to take this massive risk by letting somebody else in. Uh, we, we've talked about the canon implications of it. We'll talk about it more where she says only three people in the galaxy know this. Mm-hmm, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a fun conversation and raises some bail organic questions anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but emotionally what's powerful about it is here she is being a rebel leader, taking a massive, massive risk to get money flowing again to rebel operations. But there's also um, this power in it, this, this, uh, freeing herself from constraints because she, she gets to let somebody else in. She's in a prison, right? Where she can't show her, her true self to anybody. And this whole scene is about her going, you think, you know, who I am Tay. We've known each other for a long time and there's clearly a- affection, uh, between us. Y- all you're seeing is a public face. You do not know who I really am am and that's painful to see mothma do it but there's also a power in it of in a relief of, of her getting to express herself a little bit show herself a little bit and then the, the, for me the absolute power of it comes from tay's <laughs> very dismissive like well you're all just all in on the empire you're surrounded by it and a few of us back home have some quite spicy beliefs you know <laughs> perhaps a little too much for your taste and then she's like oh yeah i'm effer um i would like you to help me illicitly fund you know, activities of so hardcore good. rebellion that I will not even tell you what they are. And I am so good at handling the horror of being trapped in this world that I'm, uh, look how good I am at it. Waltz mm-hmm. with me and smile. And he doesn't really respond. He doesn't really do a good job. He's kind of got a dumbstruck look on his face. He does, yeah. You know, and then it comes around to the end when, when Perrin is coming back and she has to shoot out real quick. Don't trust my husband. I can't even trust him smile Mm. there's Mm. horror and power at the same time yeah i I don't have i i I can't add much more other than just clapping because i love to see it i love how it resonated with you and i love uh, hearing you talk about it it's such an important moment and and uh i'll I'll say this again with another moment i have but pays off some of the expectations for me that I had, you know, that I carried into the show, mm-hmm. spy thriller. And, and I think they, they hit everything I thought the show was going to do. They just did it in a, in a different way, which is part of the, the genius of the show and why we do absolutely love it. But this is one of those moments of the tension I thought I was going to experience was a different kind of tension. Same ballpark, same radar screen, but in a way I could never have imagined. There was clips of this scene in some of the trailers and it was like, ooh, Mothma's undercover and she, she's got to keep it secret. It's something so different because it's so deep. It's so personal. It's so just uh, in uh, all of our faces to see what's at stake. And that she's she's living with this. She's It's not just that the Empire is infiltrating her. We know her driver is a you know, spy. But uh, I think going in, I thought this was a more about the halls of government. And she's got to be careful uh, walking around the Senate chambers. No, this is her own home. That's how deep it went. And all with that beautiful, uh, tense moment of smile. Love it. I'm with you on it. It's an important one. 
Yeah, so many great lines in it too. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop myself. We'll share them again <laughs> later. That's my number three. Uh, well, my number three. This is what I what I was hitting at. There pays off a little bit of uh, my uh, wants and desires for the show coming in here because we knew we were gonna be at some point meeting Force Whitaker's Saw Guerrera and episode eight, Narkina five. Uh, it's a great episode. A lot of notes. I went back and looked. Uh, a lot of big stuff going on here. Luthen and Saw meet. Again, one of those moments I was thrilled for. I love uh, Saw Guerrero because of the questions he often brings with him. Saw's very clear in his points, but it, it makes you think about things in the rebellion. And that's what I love about it. But to bring Luthen into it, uh, yeah, we get to see Tubes, my man, Tubes. He get, tells me everything I need to see more off in the background, the Cavern Angels, X-Wings, all that stuff is great in terms of Star Wars stuff. But to get these two to sit and talk, and everything going on. From Luthen's point of view, the aren't you tired of fighting people who agree with you kind of theme that he's mm. bringing into it, and him trying to bring all uh, these groups that saw then lists off human cultists, partisan front. Like, it's, it's just, it's all <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful stuff, but the meanings behind that. But then I love the flip side of it, especially, I, this is one of those moments I washed over my English muffin and coffee this morning again, and knowing the series as it goes on and where we get to with Luthen, to have, you know, have sauce that they're going, I don't know who you are. What are you, Luthen? Who are you? To ask that question directly and to get a very different speech from Luthen, I'm a coward, I'm this, I'm all that. And it's the same Luthen that we saw with uh, our, our, our boy, our, our spy later on. Lonnie, uh, it's the same Luthen. It's different takes on it. Uh, you and I have had some wonderful conversations and some wonderful questions about who Luthen really is. We want to know as well. So to see that scene now, uh, this is one of those moments when I thought, okay, I'm going to I'm going to list some Andor moments. I had to go to this. I love Saw. I love I love having having him around. But it, again, hit me in ways I wasn't expecting. It wasn't just a checklist of things going on in the rebellion at this time. It was about the themes. It was about uh, the themes in the rebellion. It was about the big questions about how we do this. Uh, it, again, kind of resonated, connect with me, uh, even in real world ways. And now uh, going back to the scene today, I even have more questions, particularly about Saw in this scene, uh, excuse me, particularly about Luthen in this scene about, all right, yeah, who are you, man? And is that changing as the story goes along? Uh, and we'll find out. But this is my number three moment. Aren't you tired of fighting people who agree with your scene in episode eight? That is a great pick. I'm going to need to to re-examine that scene. That coward speech is is great uh, mm -hmm. from from Luthen. And I remember liking saw being just so direct of like, "Who are you?" Right. Mm -hmm. Um. In, in kind of going through some of the the scenes, there's there's the conflict between uh, Luthen and Mothma earlier in announcement where he's you know sh she's upset mm -hmm. about everything that he's set off with Eldani. And, you know, he's saying, like, I set out to build the network. The, the network's been built. You know, who's ever made a weapon and hasn't used it, you know? Yeah. Um, mm. and, and I love that kind of picture of, like, Luthen has, uh, you know, helped build this system. Maybe built it himself in, in not entirely, but he clearly mm -hmm. had a bunch of people he took vows with. Uh, but he's the go-between for everybody, right? He's yeah. the, the um, I, I want to use the word fulcrum, but that has some canon implications, <laughs> so. Uh, maybe yeah. maybe he's where the term fulcrum he's, starts. He's an access. He, yeah, he's an, an he's a, an he's, a, he's a he's a he's a spoke. He's, yes, a, hub, he's a, spoke. a hub he's with a spokes. Hub. Oh, what a hub with spokes, yeah. Luthen is. Um, but but to see him kind of have to have that understanding to, to have him, I think, a little obsessed with control. Right? He's yes. moving the pieces around on the board. He's the only one. Maybe Clea who mm -hmm. truly knows where all the different assets are. Um, so he is kind of, I think, a little obsessed with control, but he also, from the speech, it's clear that he wants the rebellion to become what it eventually is going to become. Mm -hmm. All of these groups uh, working together uh, against this common enemy of the Empire. I think we're kind of sometimes seeing maybe the most honest Luthen in front of Saw, because Saw in some ways is the closest to Luthen. You know, yes, I don't think Saws is it has the big picture in mind as much mm -hmm. as is Luthen, but Saw maybe represents a maybe Luthen is kind of represented by Saw and Mothma, uh, you know, on either mm -hmm. side of him. Of he's got the absolute militancy of Saw, but he's kind of in line with Mothma in in the big picture that the rebellion needs to get to uh, eventually. So mm -hmm. seeing him in front of Saw is just really illuminating because it, it's yeah. kind of the one time where he can be like, okay, okay. I, I normally go hard, 
but in front of saw, <laughs> I guess I'm, a, I guess I'm soft in front of saw. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, it's just, yeah, no, you're saying some great things about Luthen. You and I could probably discuss Luthen, uh, in an entire episode. Well, perhaps we will do of, uh, what does Luthen mean? Cause I, I I've had this discussion with some uh, friends and, uh, even some listeners to Force Center of like I this is me personally. I don't even, I don't even want to speak for you, sir. But like me personally, I think Luthen's this wonderful character that's not meant to be entirely inspirational. Uh, mm-hmm. Though there's inspirational things about him, uh, there's p- perhaps some lessons we're going to continue to learn. We'll see where he gets to, or see where he grows, or he might might just be what he is, and 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 what he is is a tool that is needed for the rebellion. So he's all these things and these scenes, particularly even uh, you know uh, the ones uh, later on with 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 Saw. Uh, after some of the stuff has gone down are just as powerful. But uh, yeah, I love this scene. Even just, you know, great. I, I do a bad Saw Gerrera. I apologize for doing it, but it's hard not to. I'm just like, he's slow and stupid. It's just great stuff. But, but Luther goes, eh, but he's strong, you know, like an ox. So it's all good. Love the stuff. That's why it's my number three moment. Yeah, yeah. And and it becomes more powerful uh, when they're they're talking about poor Krieger. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Well, I'll have uh, more Lutheran thoughts a little bit later. That, that's a great one. More on the way, but we are up to our number two moments. And after that, we'll take a break and come back with some honorable mentions in our number one moments. But Joseph, we're up to your number two favorite and or moment. Yeah, so this is a scene that we have uh, talked about that I know is a favorite of yours, but I really wanted to zero in on a specific thing. Uh, we're, my number two is Dewey and Freedy. Um I think that they are important because they are this sudden burst of the bizarre alien, uh, even a slightly whimsical side of Star Wars, but embedded within that whimsy is the deep themes and the deep meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, But the line that I wanted to focus on in particular is when the scene turns, right? Uh, The scene, once again, much like the time grappler scene, is set up for like, okay, more horror for Cassian and Melshi. Fun, because this is a horror parade, right? When Melshi jumps up, is like, we can make it. And they run and they get they get captured. And there's a little bit of relief because it's a little bit more uh, comedic the way they're captured in, in the, <laughs> the wet net, you know? <laughs> it's... <laughs> but as the scene was going on the first time I watched, it was like, ah, come c- come on. They, they got to get out of this. They, they can't. It feels like they're just going to be um, murdered by this weird extra from Resident Evil that, that yeah. Freedy looks like to me. Um, so when that scene turns and you realize what the scene is actually about that they're finally going to catch a break and why are they finally going to catch a break uh because these weird fission brothers Mm -hmm. um they see the truth they see what luthan is desperate to make the galaxy see uh the line in particular that i'm concentrating on is the sort of the the not today line Mm -hmm. Where uh, Dewey says, kill anyone they would. Kill the water, kill the squigglies. Carry not a snot who they kill. Yeah, Scob the empire. They not be killing ye. Naya today. Uh, it's, it's uh, to me, like a fist pumping jump up moment. Because here, here's, here's the hope, right? Yeah. That the empire's reign of terror is affecting everyone. You got senators up in their tower who aren't even willing to look at it or consider it. They just say, well... Anybody that the empire does anything to, they probably ask for it They're, you know, and so why am I, why should I feel bad about them? Here's the contrast to that, that mm-hmm. even these people who are just like, Hey, look, we got a, we got a broken old ship. We fish on this planet. We can't just do our basic day-to-day stuff because the empire is killing everything. Yeah. Um, they, uh, I, I, there, there's that, uh, turn of phrase from from game of thrones that i know you like about the the prince who is promised right yeah, these yeah. were like the wet pirates that were promised <laughs> <laughs> right there's this heroic moment of yeah. it, the the words getting out the resistance is growing let's go ah uh, this is great and you're right uh, you know you and i often have uh, similar likes and interests but we sometimes either come up with different catchphrases to summarize them or take different <laughs> things from the scene i'm glad you're the one leading this conversation because i would have just talked about squigglies being one of the best words ever created <laughs> hey biggie dinner's up there too right but biggie but, dinner but this is what the scene was about that yeah. that the horror of the empire is seeping into the, the most small day-to-day parts of the galaxy. 100%. No more, no biggie dinners like last time. It's it's important. And and you talk about fist bumping. 
I think that I'm finding that a lot of people we just did on Data Bank Dive uh, the episode how weird are Dewey and Freedy and, and and the answer is very weird and how wonderful it is. People love that episode. People have been commenting how much they love them. Uh, one of our user uh, comments came uh, a user by the name of the Real Red Five. Uh, says these guys are the exact opposite of Freck and Obi Wan, and it couldn't be uh, more <laughs> accurate. I mean, it's so true. And to get that, and I want to make clear, Nicholas Patel's music is wonderful. I love it. I don't want anyone to take anything away from uh, what I'm about to say from from my love of uh, his music. But this is a moment that I think you could have played the Force theme, and it would have worked for me. <laughs> the the not the day not today vibe. The, the Scob the Empire, and, and by the way, you read that perfectly there including the AS, uh, high A's or whatever. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's that kind of moment. It truly is. It really, really is when you dig into what's going on here, the scob, the empire kind of vibe and, and the turn. They finally get a break is how you phrased it. That's amazing. Yeah. But it comes from the people who are feeling the oppression, which is something we, we love about Solo. We love a lot about the Star Wars stories that deal with this. Um, the oppression, this is uh, 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 where it's felt, where it's truly felt. And the empire, essentially, you could do one of those weird string this story up the Death Star is destroyed because Dewey and Freedy said not today. <laughs> <laughs> right? That yeah. that chain of, of choices and sacrifices mm -hmm. that make this all possible. Yeah. Love that. Love that moment. Biggie dinner indeed. Uh, well, that is your number two moment. My number two is uh, just uh, prior to this uh, in terms of episodes. Going to episode nine, nobody's listening. And this is one I was like, I mean, I know what's out there. I know people have tweeted about it. This is going to be celebrated for a long time, but I, I can't turn away from it. And it is Kino Loy finally joining the cause, so to speak, by saying never more than 12. Though he had been there in his mind before. Uh, he had thought about it. That's why he knew. And this show and or at times challenged me, again, me personally, with, with its endings. I, I, I love a lot of the artistic choices. I don't think the endings are bad, especially on a binge rewatch. But I remember a couple of times just going, that's that's the downbeat you're ending on, a campfire conversation, a, a long look. I got it. I'm there for it, but I struggled with it. And then mm -hmm. this episode comes along, and this is one of those standing up straight in your seat kind of like, oh, God, and you kind of do that, and you get the nerd chills. And Andy Serkis says Keno Loy is just a you know, spectacular casting. It was a wonderful surprise, and it hit, and, it was, and it's probably my favorite storyline and arc within this uh, a series overall. So this moment, never more than 12 and it, and it plays out uh, all through the episode, uh, you know, him not answering, don't ask me again, getting upset. And then also early on, you know, when, when, when Cassian checks in, you got that kind of weird mix up with the guards, right? Well, where were you? We have one mm -hmm. here. And, and we were even saying a lot of people were not the only ones to so saying, well, that's got to mean something. And it, it, this is really what it meant for me. That was just like you, the number is vague. Uh, who's working at this facility is unknown. And we get the information here and it all comes together. The themes, the uh, fist pumping, uh, and just the information we needed. And a wonderful ending. Again, I don't need every TV show to end with some buttoned up shoe drop ending. But I was being challenged a little personally with Andor. And this was a, an amazing ending for me. And I absolutely love it. It's my number two moment. Yeah, I think this is such a great moment. Uh, this list would be uh, incomplete without some some Kino Loy, mm. and I think it it dovetails so well into a lot of the things that we're talking about. I, I agree with you about some of the endings that I feel like there's a sort of sometimes there's a a, a thematic ending, sometimes there's a, a bit of an emotional cliffhanger. Um, for me, sometimes watching the episodes, we're like, I'm I, I I'm I'm left wanting more because I because mm. the story feels so unresolved. To me, I prefer an ending that is it makes me excited for what I can see is going to happen next, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what this one is. It pro it propels you into the next episode, into wanting the next episode, because you understand what is going to happen next. That campfire ending, you know, I feel like the narrative cliffhanger is can Cassian finish his homework on time? Like, yeah. I, I know the emotional, you know, cliffhanger is how invested is Cassian? What's going to happen with this whole heist? All that. But this was just such high stakes uh because you know that the uh, prison escape is coming but i think the the emotional uh just celebration of that moment goes a lot to what we've been talking about of the empire relies on people uh following the system mm. but also sort of believing the lie of the system right of yeah. saying we're an organized government who wants uh, peace and security for our society. So sometimes we're very firm with wrongdoers. Mm. But hey, 
if you do your time, you know, and mm-hmm. do what's asked of you, you'll be free. And we know in this story, it's a lie. Um, and we're watching Kino Loy. And this is, I think, is what is spectacular about uh, Andy Serkis's performance is being able to show us that, like, he knows it's a lie, mm. but he can't let himself see it because that's too horrifying. Yeah. So he's trying everything he can for two episodes to cling to the lie yeah. and watching a human free themselves of the lie and in that moment find a little bit of power in just saying, I'm taking the shackles off. I've been lied to. This is the truth. Mm-hmm. I think that's the power of the moment as much for me as, mm-hmm. it, and, and now we're ready. I'm giving Cassie the information. We're doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm committed. But it's also just the, the, the victory for him of allowing himself to say, yep, I was, I was believing a lie. I was hiding in the comfort of a lie. Hiding in the comfort of a lie, something Dewey and Freedy would never do. Uh, but <laughs> no. you're absolutely, absolutely right. This the setup to this, the death of Ulov, it's all uh, all part of it, and it just leads to this moment that um, it's so funny too. Because uh, even as they're walking down the hall, you're almost just like yelling at Cassian, "Ask it, ask it, ask the question," <laughs> and he does, and it just pays off in the most wonderful way. Uh, so there you go, my number two moment, never more than twelve, Kino Loy is in the fight. He's left the comfort of the lie. Great way to say it. We're going to take a quick break here in Star Wars Rank. When we come back, we got some honorable mentions, of course, and then our number one choices for our favorite moments in Andor. Stick around for more Star Wars Rank. Welcome back to Star Wars Ranked. I'm Ken Napsok. That is Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm acting like he's sitting across the broadcast table. <laughs> uh, we are in different locations. Uh, the power of magic and technology. We are talking about Andor, the series that just wrapped up on Disney+. Plus. Much celebrated, much discussed, a lot of takes, hot and cold and warm. All the takes on the show, <laughs> as there should be, because it was a wonderful piece of storytelling and Star Wars storytelling. Uh, as always, here in Star Wars Rank, we have some honorable mentions, some things that didn't quite make the list. Joseph and I, over the years, have tried to work to contain ourselves, because often we'll just go, well, here's the 10 other things I really need to talk about, <laughs> because we love to celebrating this stuff. But Joseph, uh, what's on your list here today? Uh, so uh, some specific moments, but also wanting to celebrate uh, characters and find the moments that resonated with me. Uh, so I'll start with a character that I really, truly loved, uh, Nemec. Um, I, I love yeah. not just his manifesto, but the, that he was kind of coded as, as uh, you know, a nerd in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody who built accurate models and, and cared about their condition. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, uh, somebody who really wanted, I think this show was uh, so much about ideology and your relationship to it and how do you make ideology not this uh, cold uh, faraway conceptual thing but how does the ideology affect your life and your loved one's lives um but also this real importance of we we really have to define what are we doing and why and why does it matter and, and i think it's a thing that is lacking in the real world in our discourse. I think there's lots of things that distract us from it. And and I think that as much as possible, we should go, well, I I make this choice. I support this person. I believe in this. Why? Because it's all funnels to what kind of society do we want? What do we believe in? Mm -hmm. Now, what actions are we going to take to support those beliefs? And Nemec is somebody who's like, I'm going to write it down. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to reason it out and I'm going to write it down and I'm going to put it in front of other people. This is my persuasive argument. Mm of this is what tyranny is and this is what freedom means. Make a choice um, based on on this. Maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't, but it's important to look at it. Uh, So I I love everything about his manifesto, but but the Nemec moment that charmed the hell out of me was that he has that old uh, star path unit that's, you know, really hard to figure out how to work, but once you Mm. know how to work it, uh, you have a full and complete understanding of it. You can fix it if it breaks. Um, there's something about it that was fun for me to see this uh, this younger character have a real old man yelling at clouds moment. Because like, <laughs> if I ever show my dad this show, he's going to love this moment. He's like, yep, yep. And that's why you shouldn't have computers on cars. Like, um, Or like, yep, and that's why you should have a compass in your hand that you know how it works, not on your phone. Like, um, there's a, there is an old man yelling at clouds vibe to it, but I love this idea that it's a part of this whole speech about how the empire 
mm-hmm. is eroding uh, freedom, choice, skills, knowledge at a mind bending pace. And this is a great uh, example of it where in the past, th- these are skills and big picture knowledge that people would gain. And instead, the empire is using technology to infantilize people and, mm-hmm. and make them subservient. And, you know, I, I don't think that the show is necessarily singling out any one piece of technology, but that's an important conversation to have about technology of yeah. what's a convenience and what's something where we're trying, where a corporation is trying to box us in and say, we don't want you to know how this works because we want a subservient. We want you subservient to us and our prices. So, mm-hmm. you know, it is a charming moment for Nemec, a powerful moment for Star Wars. Yeah. Theoretically, a moment my dad's going to love, um, but also a, a, a thought starter <laughs> about technology. Hey, look, my dad will watch it have the same reaction. It'll turn to me and say, "This is why you don't buy Apple computers." All right, this is this is <laughs> absolutely where he would, what he would take from it. No, I love it, and Nemec ha- has to be represented on the show uh, in some way. And this is powerful. I always going to say my, one of my honorable mentions might have been anytime Skeen went, Nemec's just about the cause, but not as, not as inspirational. <laughs> He's writing a manifesto. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a great one. What else is on your list? Uh, Cyril's stalker turn. Um, <laughs> yes. C- Cyril is, uh, is uh, such a, a great character mm-hmm. in that uh, we we have i have a deep empathy for him while finding his actions abhorrent yeah, um yeah. and there could be a million moments uh the 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 that we, and i think you have some on your list so i won't even say yeah. them. Um, but i really liked that we have seen characters like cyril before imperial types we've seen them on screen we've seen them in, in books mm-hmm. who are obsessive rigid don't question anything, but to see this character's humanity and the way this show masterfully sort of showed us the way that his, uh, in my opinion, mother's awful treatment of him ha- has caused him to seek status and to seek external validation and go like, Oh, I'm so sorry for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the shock of like, Oh, but we're not used to them being this sort of logical, those kind of damaged characters being like full on stalkers, right? Mm-hmm. And literally stalking her waiting outside her place of business putting all of his need for external validation on her and then really crossing that line too. It's not just an Imperial that he looks up to basically like mm. I'm paraphrasing, but like your beauty stopped me from ending it. Oh, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that's a, that's, that's uh not emotionally fair. No. <laughs> no. And crossing a line from you're a professional inspiration to, I have put you on an, I, uh, on a, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I've elevated you and I've made you everything. Uh, yeah, well said, and and yeah, Cyril uh, got some stuff on Cyril too. But uh, this this moment um, is frightening in so many ways, and and frightening in that it is the path there is understandable. Meaning, like you can see how you get there, and maybe hopefully some of the lessons are how you get off of that train. Uh, we'll see. We'll see where Cyril goes. I, I I still hold to this, and I know you do as well. I don't think there's a redemption story for Cyril coming, but maybe, maybe. But doesn't look like that's the, the themes and purpose and lessons of the character. So great yeah, moment. I- I can't wait to see where he and uh, Dedra's odd relationship go. So uh, that's one for me, me uh, a <laughs> serial stalker turn. Uh, Try to move through these others uh, yeah. uh, more quickly. Uh, B2 emo must be celebrated. Uh, yes. There's a, a million uh, moments. So I picked one that just really re- resonated with me. It's small, it's quick, uh, but it, it's uh, once Marva has so sadly passed and Brazo is trying to get B2 emo to come back to his apartment and in Brazo saying, uh, let's get going. And, B2 Emo says, I'm charging. <laughs> <laughs> Brasser responds, you've been charging all day. Uh, it, it's uh, We come to learn that uh, once B2 Emo gets what he wants and Brass is going to stay, he rolls out of his charging bed. No problem. A manipulative little little uh, mm. droid that he is. <laughs> uh, but just the, the image of that little charging bed that you have to sit in, it's a little doggy bed. Uh, but man, so much, so many of us are so tired. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and we want to we want to keep charging even when we've been charging all day like please just uh, just let me stay in my warm safe happy place it's so relatable so that's my favorite uh, b2 emo moment uh yeah b2's gotta be on here there's so many moments he captured uh, a, a world basically not just a nation he captured many nations b2 emo yeah 
Yeah. Uh, la- do you want me to just do my last two? Yeah, or? yeah. G- hit me with your uh, last two there. Okay, yeah. I, I swapped one out on you because I-, okay. I remembered I had to keep this line in here. Uh, I love Clem's line in the flashback. Uh, they don't look down. They don't look past the rust. Um, mm. We could talk a-, a lot about that. Is there, you know, it's a salvaging lesson. It's an a- a- an explanation for how Andor's skill for observing everything and how it connects and where everybody is and not overlooking any little detail. It's a great explanation of that. But also just, uh, you know, they don't look down, they don't look past the rust is is a great new twist on don't judge a book by its cover. You know, it's a great twist on everyone and everything matters. Uh, Mm -hmm. My final one is, is going back uh, to the, the Luthan discourse. Um, His speech is of course amazing. It is fascinating. Um, but one of my favorite shots in all of Andor is just the elevator door opening and this terrified plant of Lonnie seeing dark cloak Luthen mm-hmm. <laughs> standing in the bowels of Coruscant, that cloak uh, just sort of uh, billowing, you know, looking like he is best friends with Vader, right? Mm-hmm. Um I think that I think Luthen is so complicated because I think he sees the big picture of what happens. He does pray for that that new dawn uh, where people have freedom in another choice. But I do think that while he feels great guilt in, in a great pull to connection, I think he's trying to shut off emotion. He's trying to shut off connection. He's trying to say it's OK to take people's agency away. It's one thing to sacrifice for the cause by your choice. Luthen's at times taking other people's agencies away and making a choice to sacrifice others without their involvement. Mm -hmm. And I do, for me, feel like there's a contrast there between the story of hope in Star Wars where connection is actually strength. And Mm -hmm. here's Luthen talking about how he's shut off connection and is willing to do anything that the enemy would do. He'll do it back to them twice as much. Um, and I feel like that's not the whole story of Luthen. I think that's mm. a belief that that he's trying to cling to because he thinks that's for the best. Yeah. Um, it, it, so I, I'm not necessarily just condemning him. I think that's what makes him really fascinating. Yeah. But I think the the darkest of what Luthen could be is all there in that shot where he looks by all the language of Star Wars like someone to run from. Yes. Yes. Yes, everything about that shot. It means a lot of things. And, and again, just listening to you talk about Luthen reminds me just like even the Saw stuff uh, before, the Saw stuff after. Like it, it, Luthen's just presenting a lot of different things in it. And I love that about him. Love that. Love that. Yeah, so that's 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 my list. Cutting myself off. No, that's great. That's great. Running through my honorable mentions here. Got a couple here in one, but it's just simply a category called Brasso in action. Uh, <laughs> early on in the show, uh, he has the episode three, he has that uh, moment where he takes out a mobile tack pod by strapping it down. It's a great uh, scene. Uh, it's it's violent. It's in your face. It's rough, but it's also inspiring. And he has that shot where he walks away. And so many people tweeted out, you know, Brasso's a real one. <laughs> and it's just like, I love that. <laughs> and that was just kind of one thing. And then he kind of fades away in the show. Then he comes back in and uh, a big episode. And then, of course, uh, episode 12, uh, Rick's Road, where he bricks at Imperial with Marva's brick, even to make it even more personal. And then that big cheer that a lot of, call it, a lot of people call it like a pro wrestling cheer, whatever you want to call it, however you want to connect to it. It's wonderful. And, and to me, even though, again, I love that first moment. To me, the when he bricks that imperial, it's completely paying off the Brasso's a real one meme that was going around. It's like, yep, <laughs> yep, he is. He truly is. Yeah, it's so great too because that you, you know Marv would be cheering for it, right? Oh yeah, it's like it's not disrespectful to her brick. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know uh, this brick of uh, fights fascists is yeah. you know what uh, what Marvel wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She'd be yelling, use my brick. Come on, Brasso, grab my brick. Uh, there you go. Uh, my uh, next one is uh, Luthen in action. I, you know, the Fondor double laser wing attack, that whole sequence is great. <laughs> we didn't get a lot of that in the show. And it was sold in the trailers a little bit. I'm not saying that the trailers lied, but just like we saw some of the clips and it was great. You got the Cantwell class uh, cruiser there. All that stuff is great. But And I'm not one that's for the Luthen is a Jedi theory. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll listen to your theories on Luthen's past. Uh, related to that, that, but I just think it's a double laser wing, and that's pretty cool. But it was just what he was done. He's so, you know, he's he's turned around to take on the Tie Fighters and the Cruiser in a way. He's 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 not the coward that he was telling Saab, though that was a different meaning of the word, of course. Uh, 
but it's everything about it. And, and, and it's so Luthan. Like, all right, we got to, we got to fight. We got to fight. We got to break free. We got to break free. And he's got uh, David W. Collins voicing the Fondor ship there. It all kind of works. And, uh, you know, I'm here for some of the pew pew action. And this was one of the more, uh, you know, classic Star Wars moments. And, and I love it for that. Yeah, absolutely. It had high tension, but it also had comedy and great action. I love that. Oh, though, the, there's trouble in this area. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> and then just the, it's it's so Luthan that, you know, his ship is hiding many layers as well. It truly is. And then you mentioned it. We're not done talking about Cyril Karn, but I think you and I could probably, uh, based just on our own lives, we've been pretty open and honest. Some of the stuff about Edie and Edie Karn, but Edie and Cyril Karn, a breakfast cereal story <laughs> is the uh, Broadway play I want to see here. Uh, uh, just amazing stuff. It goes to, you know, look, Cyril, Cyril's a bad guy. Cyril is presented as that. Uh, there's a lot of things, uh, like I said, lessons um, to take from him. But this was an interesting wrinkle uh, with his mother, Edie. You you understand a lot of it. It's very, it's very real of all the real and grounded things in the show. I think this, their exchanges, their moments were some of the most real stuff. It hit for me on a personal level, just my past working through some things uh, and uh, choices I made to try to move away from that, to try not to be a serial in a lot of other ways. That even goes to the job I used to have or some of the struggles I used to have in relationships. Um, I, I, I feel along the way I've made some good choices that I'm proud of to move away from serial. So I see a lot. I don't want to say I see a lot of myself in serial, but I see a lot of what I could have been and a lot of it is related to those breakfast cereal moments so it's comedy it is star wars mundane star wars stuff with cereal at a breakfast table with your mom that is a star wars mom that is uh more dangerous than we ever could have imagined and it's very real and it's very much in the uh what the show's trying to do and uh I, therefore i loved them all i loved all the moments for that yeah, no, it, the, those scenes are so great for showing us um, the cycle of abuse, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, uh, that Cyril is going through that produces these kind of things. And, and yep. I, I, I agree with you. There's lots of like, this is a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there is this great dark comedy of uh, this passive aggressive relationship where on the surface they're like we're mom and son and we love each other and we live together and we want the best for each other right right and they're right. constantly sniping at each other it's it's not that hidden but from cyril there's this level of like i can't scream scob you mother i hate you <laughs> so i will communicate it by the way i slurp my breakfast oh yes <laughs> yes oh beautiful stuff I, i'm in a weird way like i i, I so, kind of sometimes just want to Go back and rewatch those scenes. It's so mm -hmm. it's so weird to say, but they're so great. They're so great. They're so great. So my final moment is uh, a big moment towards the end in Rick's Road. It is Marva's her speech, her entire speech uh, that is broadcast from B two emo at uh, the funeral is amazing, and uh, I think it's perhaps one of my favorite speeches in the show, and a show that's full of great speeches. Uh, but the moment of the fight the Empire, which is now we're seeing some stuff that they tried to sneak in. A different F word into that moment. And I'm glad it went this way. I don't mind the real uh, swear word that appeared earlier in the show. I don't always love the Carabas, uh, the Dank Ferrex and all that stuff. But I, I do like Scob the Empire. That's actually one of my favorite Star Wars curse words. Uh, but I, I like that this moment was just direct. Uh, it was fight the Empire. Uh, and I like what that means. I like how the moment played. And it was a fist pumping moment indeed. And that episode builds so well. The tension builds, the band, everything about it. Wonderful episode, gets all the press for all the right reasons, but it all kind of led to that moment of like, you're waiting for someone to say it. You're waiting for someone to just express uh, this idea and kind of put it to, out there for everyone of this is what you got to do. There is no more waiting and it's Marva post-death. So therefore, I want to celebrate it because I love it indeed. Yeah, just the blatant communication. Fight the Empire. I saw those headlines, but I didn't read the articles. There was going to be an F-bomb there? Yeah, the, I think it was, uh, what's her name, Denise Gao. Uh, uh, Miro, did you, did you said that and that um, they were trying to get it in. Uh, yeah, so I don't know the details of it myself um, other than that's kind of the vibe I got. Whether 100% sure or not, I don't know, but I'm glad uh, personally where it landed. Not because I'm afraid of that word being in Star Wars. I don't necessarily think it belongs because this is still skewed younger. Um you know, uh, it is what it is. Uh, but I just think, I actually think it was more powerful to say Bite the Empire. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And as always, my main struggle with uh, Star Wars swearing is, yeah, definitely the the age thing and the access thing and all that. Um, but every time I hear an actual swear word in Star Wars, my big question is, okay, if that word exists, why hasn't Han been saying it every other word? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> yes. I also do want Han to say Scob. I think that would be great too. Oh, yeah. All right. We have reached our number one moments. We've been looking at Andor and we have our favorite moments here. I'll go first. So Joseph can end the show with his. Uh, mine is kind of a connection of moments, but it's one sequence. And it's from episode three, Reckoning. It is the Marva flashing back as she sits there in her chair, uh, cold because she can't afford to turn on the heat and uh, Cassian has uh, left. She flashes back to leaving Canari with Clem and Casa. And they're in the ship and the sun, the brightness in the, in the ship flying away from Canari. And then at the same time, you got Cassian leaving with Luthen. And he's kind of flashing back in his own way, looking out of the Fondor and seeing kind of a similar image to when he left. And, and th there's a lot of reasons I could list this moment, go into like the themes of and everything. But this is a moment I just have to say is it's, it's a gut reaction moment for me. Uh, when we talked about on a review, we we watched the first three episodes together like uh, everyone. We had the screeners um, a little bit before, and I did not want to go into episode four. You did not as well. We held to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was happy where I was because I the show was hitting me. I was excited, loved the show, and loved what was going on. But some some of the early struggles that would emerge for a lot of other people or the discourse around the show, is it Star Wars enough? Is it, is it boring? Uh, what's, all those kind of things um, were roaming through my head where I was I'm not sure quite yet where I land on it other than I love what they're doing. I love how it looks. Um, but I could not leave this moment uh, behind. I, I, I joked on the review, but I had to drive to a comedy show right after this. <laughs> I was driving to the comedy club, just like replaying this with the music, the moment, the feel. And again, you could get into the themes of it. You could get into Cassian going out on this venture. It's a hero's call kind of moment is in his own kind of way. It's a different kind of version of it. And then also the one that he didn't necessarily have a choice on with Marva and Clem and what that all means, but what she maybe meant by that moment and what was even going on there with Republic and the emerging separatists and all those kind of Star Wars things. But this is where I think the show really does work. The little moments, the quieter moments, or even one like this that I would say it's a big moment, it stayed with me. It stayed with me for a couple of days. It made me think. It made me go back to revisit it. It, it got me emotional, but also just made me think, all right, I'm not 100% sure with what this show is doing. I'm on board, but where's it taking me? And that I just couldn't. I was haunted in the most wonderful way. So that's why it's my number one moment, uh, the Marva flashback and Cassian leaving with Luthen. I think that's such a great choice because it does have that great energy of that's the first arc. It, it makes that arc feel very complete. We are yeah. launching off to adventure, to escape for Cassian to, you know, take his uh, first steps towards what we know from Rogue One is is mm -hmm. going to be his, his destiny. Yeah. Um, but it also just really, really makes crystal clear who this character is. He's somebody who cares about people. He cares about his people. And it is painful for him to, mm. to leave them and to see that cycle of when he first met Marva, she was saving his life by mm. taking him away from his people. And now here he is again with somebody who is saving his life uh, by taking him away from the woman who took him mm -hmm. away that first time in that yeah. cycle of love and lost it loss and, and, and seeing it in his eyes is just uh, emotionally, you know, uh, extremely powerful, sets you up for the series, sets you up for who Cassian Andor truly is. Yeah, it was a moment that was almost like a song to me, like one of those uh, somber rocks, uh, <laughs> rock songs uh, that just gets you thinking and stays with you there. So uh, that is my number one moment. But, sir, we are on to your number one favorite moment in Andor. What do you have for us? I got a weird number one because it's kind of at the emotional core. It is a mashup of, of two kind of small moments, two small lines, but they speak volumes. And just like your number one, it really is about Cassian and, and Marva. Hmm. Um, it, it's, uh, I guess in some ways my, my number one is their relationship. Uh, yeah. There's so many wonderful lines of like, uh, you know, I'll never be okay. I'll be worried about you all the time. And, you know, can't do anything, but that's just love. Can't do anything about that. Great line. All that. Um, her, her entire, uh, uh, speech, fight the empire, great stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but the two moments that I went to is these kind of contrasting moments that I think are at the heart of the show is Cassian trying after the Eldani job, trying to convince Marva to leave. Mm -hmm. She's got all those great things about deciding to fight the empire. But when Cassian says, uh, we'll go someplace warm and easy mm. that line has just st 
stuck with me because how many times do we talk about when we're frustrated and like, what I'm, I'm just, I'm moving to the woods. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm going somewhere uh, warm and easy. I'm getting away from all this. And of course uh, we, we all want and need moments in our lives that are warm and easy. We don't want life to be yeah. warm and easy, but it's so clear that casting mm. is lying to himself mm. that that's not the way of the galaxy anymore. And in that moment, Marva kind of plays along. And then it's the scene later where she's like, no, <laughs> mm, mm. I can't do it. Uh, so there's the the warm and easy line that immediately uh, falls apart for Cassian. He can't even go to space 7-Eleven to get pizos <laughs> without being arrested for no reason. So warm and easy. Mm. Uh, but contrasting that line that that just resonates with me with the line in Marva's, you know, uh, final speech projected by B2 Emo mm. that there's a wound at the center of the galaxy. Mm. And to me, uh, I, I went on about that, about the Andor report, about Marva's talking about the the Empire. It's similar to what Dewey and Freedy are saying of like, they, it, it's just going to continue. They're spreading out everywhere. I, I almost think of it, Marva doesn't know this truth. I think of it as, as Palpatine. Something wounded yeah. him that drove him toward the Sith. And He's never going to heal that wound, whatever it was. He's just going to inflict all that pain and hate and anger on the entire galaxy. There's a wound at the center of the galaxy, and it's not going to go away. Incredibly powerful by itself. But these two lines come together to sort of form this, this question and answer of Cassian mm -hmm. is sort of pleading. Why can't we just walk away from it? Why can't I just do the thing I want to do, the totally understandable thing? Just take my loved ones and be yeah. safe and hide out from the storm. Why can't I go somewhere warm and easy? And Marva's kind of answering that by saying, there's a wound at the center of the galaxy and it's spreading and spreading and there's nowhere warm and easy anymore. And it's horrible that we have to accept that. It's horrible that it's true, but we have to accept it. And I think it's kind of, that's Cassian's journey, right? Mm -hmm. Of accepting there is no more warm and easy anywhere. And if anybody believes it, it's a lie because there's a wound at the center of the galaxy. Even on Nayamos, yeah. And it's, uh, you're saying some really poignant stuff there. So uh, I won't step on that too much other than say this This is a great uh, sequence of events. This is, like you said, a lot of the core. Uh, it resonated with you, resonated with me, uh, but also just the, the real world kind of um, connection with some... Uh, with Cassian, uh, him trying to get out of his 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 home, so to speak, of I, I struck it rich, mom, we can get out of here. We don't have to stick around for this. And I know that connect with a lot of folks out there with a different background and uh, perspectives than you and I, too. I heard a lot of conversation about that, what that moment means for them in the real world, what it meant for Cassian in Star Wars. And this is one of the victories of the show, of course. It was so real. It was so in your face. No new themes. We always say no new themes that aren't present in other parts of Star Wars, but just served up in a way that you couldn't ignore. And that you you had to see, which is also kind of what Marv was saying. You kind of have <laughs> to see this. You have to connect to it. There's a wound at the center of the galaxy. It's certainly what it's about. And hey, it leads to, uh, like you said, Cassian in sandals with a beautiful person in his bed. Just want more pizzos. I mean, come on. It's the <laughs> life. But it is for Cassian and for so many a lie. And why we love that scene. Great. Number one to take us home. Oh, thank you very much. This was a great exercise in trying to pick the moment and, and <laughs> in the sadness of leaving others on the table. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We'll always have Andor to discuss season one. Season two going to be a little bit uh, in the future. So we'll uh, revisit uh, this show again, I'm sure, many times before season two comes back. Uh, a lot of fun. Thank you all for listening. I'll tell you where you can find us. We're on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on Hive Social at Force Center. Uh, when that gets back up and running, time of the recording, it is uh, not. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. We are asking people, uh, hey, directly, if you'd love to help us grow our YouTube channel, we have some cool things coming, announcements shortly. Go ahead and head over to YouTube and subscribe. We'd love to get to 7,000, and the number is growing thanks to all of you. Uh, we feel these direct asks are something that's hard for us. Just <laughs> our generation doesn't ask for much. Joseph and I. 
But we're asking you guys are delivering and we appreciate that. So subscribe on YouTube if you want. You can get merch at tpublic.com slash user slash four center podcast available in a lot of different spots. Just search. You'll find us. And if you like to, you can support us directly at patreon.com slash four center. From there, you can get into our discord. You can follow me at Ken Napsuck. Go to my website, kennapsuck.com. I have a shop on there. You can buy a personalized copy of my book, Why the Star Wars for the holiday season if you like to there. Find other shows and comedy shows and things I do. Joseph, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on social media at Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm still on Twitter. Also, Instagram, TikTok, Hive. If Hive uh, comes back at the time <laughs> of this recording, I will be there. I'm on Mastodon. Find me if you can. Uh, it's fun, but difficult. Uh, you can also check out my YouTube channel while you're subscribing uh, to Four Center. If you want to do that, uh, please also consider uh, subscribing to my channel. Uh, I got some short films up there and some comedy stuff and some podcasts and more stuff coming in the new year as well. And and hey, if you like comedy uh, and comedy albums, uh, I have a bunch of comedy albums that I forget to mention enough yeah. uh, on Bandcamp. So you can uh, go to Bandcamp and search Joseph Scrimshaw and multiple comedy albums uh, will pop up if you're looking for a, a comedy gift for the holidays. Great stuff to look at and get. Thank you all for listening. That is it for today. Star Wars has been ranked. <laughs>